Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Complex Like Wine, the podcast where we talk about complicated things and improve over time just like wine does. I have my mentor actually here with us this week. This is Deanna, and so she's going to share a lot of really insightful things for us. I think people that aren't familiar or have someone related or a close member on the spectrum are aware of, and so I'm... I'm really happy that you're here wanting to share that with me in the podcast. Yes, thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. It's still so weird to be called a mentor. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Makes yeah. you feel older than I am. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. No. But I appreciate all the times you've yes, met with me to like, yes. just give me insight, yeah. Yeah, I always think like when if, when I was first starting out, I wish like what are the things I wish that person would have told me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we're drinking a Cabernet Sauvignon today, so cheers. Cheers. <laughs> it's delicious, by the way. Oh, you're It's tra- good. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot to bring the bottle, but it's from San Antonio Winery. It's the Santo Stefano Cabernet, if people are curious. But, yeah, so we're talking about autism today, and your son mm-hmm. was has autism. So I want to share more, like, I want to start off with kind of sharing when he was born to now. How old is he now? He's six. Six, okay. So kind of like when you guys first started noticing yeah. symptoms and everything. Yeah, well, I'm going to go back just a little bit because... When I was pregnant with him, I was in grad school, and it was my last semester of grad school, and I forgot the name of the class. It was like social communications or something like that, and our professor was really obsessed with autism for some reason. I don't know if like one of his grandchildren were on it, or so we watched a lot of videos about autism awareness and PSAs, and I remember watching this video of this little boy having autism and how he wouldn't want to hug his mom and and how he didn't want to play with anyone else, you know, these meltdowns. And I remember thinking, like, oh, my gosh, I hope my son doesn't have autism. Mm -hmm. So when I got the diagnosis, I felt, like, this huge amount of grief. Like, Mm -hmm. not grief, but, like, guilt. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, did I, like, I I wish not for this, and, like, we have it. Right. And I think autism is is who Grayson is, who my son is. He's six years old, and he's smart, and he's funny, and... We have all the interventions that we need for him to succeed. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm not afraid of that diagnosis. And I'm really relieved we got it. Because once we did, all those um, resources just like flew into our lives. Like right. we have him in all types of different therapies, put him on an IEP for school so he can, you know, thrive in the best way he can. Mm-hmm. How old was he when you guys officially got the diagnosis? So he was th- four. Four. And what happened it was we it was during the pandemic too. So we kind of saw the signs after he turned one. Um, he kind of regressed as far as speech goes. And he was doing a lot of like pointing and not using his words and things like that. And he was really starting to kind of obsess over things. So we did like when you do your uh, well visits, they do a checklist mm-hmm. for you, at least in the state of California. And so you have to mark like what are some of the things you see. And so he failed it. And so he would have had the autism referral at 18 months. But we did it again with the doctor, the pediatrician. He's like, no, he's okay. He's like, he doesn't look like he has autism. So I was like, okay. So we're always kind of like, all right. Yeah. And then we had my daughter when he was 20 months. He's about two. Um, And then when she was growing up and and developing, we're like, oh, Grayson never did that. He never did that. Mm. And then he was having problem running at like two and a half. So we got him physical therapy and then we couldn't understand him a lot. And he was going to meltdown. So we felt that was because of his speech, but it was because of autism. So we had him in therapies already. Mm -hmm. And then we were trying to do the autism um, uh, assessment, but it went online during the, during the pandemic. So that's not as effective. No. And I I just knew that we wouldn't, it wouldn't be helpful. Mm -hmm. So we waited. And then finally, um, after he was in preschool, he like tested really far behind everybody and wasn't doing well in school. And one of the teachers had a son who's on the spectrum. She's like, I think you should get him tested. And we're like, okay. Because everyone else we said, it's like, no, he's he's so talkative. He's so touching. Like, he's like, there's not, and I say there's nothing wrong with him. There's nothing wrong with him. Which even then I was like, well, yeah, but you know, he, there, of course there's nothing wrong with him. But if he has something, we need to get him help. Mm-hmm. We need the intervention early on. So, and those few months leading up to it were really hard. He would, we wouldn't be able to understand him. He'd go into meltdowns and we had no idea what to do with him. Mm-hmm. We put him in time out, calm him down. Like we didn't have the tools that we now have. And so when we did that, um, that assessment, it was like 30 seconds in. I was like, oh, oh, I see it now. Mm-hmm. And the, and the way the doctor did it was so interesting because he had a toy 
And then he put the toy away after playing with it for a couple of seconds. And then he kept going back to that toy. He was obsessive about that toy. Mm-hmm. He couldn't transition. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, oh, that's what it is. So I remember it hit my husband really hard. But for me, it was like a, it was like a weight lifted off of me. Because I was like, okay, now I know. And it's just, it's not something else. We're not, we're not still thinking. And like I said, the, the floodgates open as far as resources. Right. We got him, I mean, he wasn't even in school yet. We called a school district and we got him an IEP. So we got him in a special preschool for kids on the spectrum mm-hmm. to be in a classroom with other kids who were, who are neurotypical. So he could be around kids on the spectrum and then in a regular typical classroom, mm-hmm. which I think has helped him thrive in kindergarten. Oh yeah. So for people that don't know what's I is it I IEP or IEP? IEP is an mm-hmm. individual education plan. Okay. So it's for any kids who are going to have like a learning disability. It might be for students who have like uh, English as a second language. It's really great. I think a lot of times I see parents, they feel like they have to bring lawyers or they're scared of IEPs because the teachers in school districts are giving you recommendations on, or they might recommend like you don't need to be in a regular education class. You need to maybe in a special education or pullouts. But I love it, but we're also lucky because I work in the healthcare side and right. my husband's a teacher. So we know the system really well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why I like talking about it because I don't want people to be afraid of it. Mm-hmm. The IEP has been wonderful. We can look at it and say, you know what, that that system that you have for him isn't working. That pullout isn't working. Or can we add that he always has to be able to have a sensory toy in the class? Mm-hmm. And we tell him that that's not a toy and has on his paperwork. So even a substitute comes in, they can't take it away from him. Because they know that he needs that to right. be able to um, regulate himself and be able to be be okay in class. Right. Now that's I could imagine. I can imagine why parents would be maybe intimidated or oh, scared. Because yeah. especially with that, you when it's your child, you just want to make sure that your child's okay. And yes, yeah, yeah. And I think the thing too is that a lot of um, parents, I think that the school district's telling them what to do, and it's basically like they'll look at it through tests and analysis and like. This is what we think will work best for your kid. You're still the advocate. Mm -hmm. You can say yes or no. And I would also listen to them. And if you don't like what they're saying, you can get a second opinion. You could talk to a therapist, talk to a doctor, Mm -hmm. um, talk to your local regional center. I mean, I think that's one thing people don't know. I think when you have a kid who has a special um, needs, there's so much out there for you. You don't have to do it alone. And like ask people like me. Talk to other parents. Autism is really common. I think they say it's like one in eight now. Wow. Yeah, so anytime I post about my son being autistic, I either get like three or four uh, questions like, what were the signs? How did you know? And then um, suggestions on how to navigate the system. Mm. Wow, one in eight. Yeah, and it's the thing since there is a wide spectrum, right? Yes. So when, how, like how, what were some things for like therapy that were the most beneficial for your son? Yeah, so I honestly, I think the most beneficial thing for him is us learning how to best take care of him, and that was through those therapies. So mm-hmm. there's one thing that he does called ABA, which stands for Applied Behavioral Analysis, and that is kind of, I don't know, not, not like controversial, but I think a lot of people who did ABA like 10, 15 years ago, it's changed a lot. Mm-hmm. So I think some people think of ABA as like trying to change autism characteristics, characteristics. But for me and my husband, it's like, this is how we deal with Grace and me on the autism and spectrum. And this is how we can help them navigate through these things that um, that kids usually want to have such a hard time navigating mm-hmm. through. And so one thing I like to say is like, being autistic is just being human. We can't, so when we're upset, we might get really, really mad, but we can self-regulate. Mm-hmm. Kids on the spectrum always can't. So we mm-hmm. have to teach in that. Mm-hmm. And with Grayson, um, he, his thing is a lot of social cues. So it's like his him trying to learn how to tell jokes has been really funny lately because they get a little dark. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but he just doesn't know what's funny. Right. He doesn't know what's socially funny. But with the ABA, they've had a therapist come into the home and then we'll go. He did a play clinic today. He'll be in a clinic with a bunch of other kids. And they just um, – they – they work with him and get him to have specific goals. So one of the goals for him is transition. So like I said, with his diagnosis, the way we knew that he had autism is because he was playing with something and he didn't want to transition to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And some kids, especially at that age, might cry and they can move on, but he right. can't move on. He has yeah. to go back to it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times with him, if he's talking about something, he won't stop talking about it. Mm-hmm. So we've learned things like distinct, uh, extinction with his ABA therapist where we go, we're not talking about it anymore. You've told me everything you need to tell me about that. 
we're moving on. Mm -hmm. And he can cry and get mad, but then we move on. It's a lot of redirection, just Mm -hmm. like any normal little kid. Right. But he's going to have to have those things his entire life. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also just knowing when he needs a sensory break and what things work for him. So I always have like thing of Play-Doh, a squishy toy. If things are getting too loud for him, like, hey, let's go over here and play with some sand play with some slime, things that kind of just calm them down, right. things he can touch and just kind of feel well-regulated. And things like we we use. Like if mm-hmm. you're in a meeting, they might give you a fidget spinner. Right. Those are stuff he uses. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, oh, kind of going back to when people would say like, oh, your son is quote-unquote fine, like no autism because he's social, like different, you know, quote-unquote yeah. symptoms. Or... Yeah, he's stubborn. That's what people would tell me. He's just stubborn. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, I knew. I just knew it. Yeah. Have has he been able to? Or I mean, I guess the question is, with as clinics are they with also other kids on the spectrum? Yeah. So yeah. the clinic he goes to on Saturday, we call it play group for him. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. So he's with other kids. So what they do is they start with the the one on one therapist and they move into the group. Mm-hmm. And he has a hard time with the group sometimes because he is stubborn too. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just him being my child. He's he's gonna be stubborn because I'm stubborn. But um, he doesn't always want to play with other kids because he wants to do what he wants to do. Right. So it's kind of they give him the tools to learn how to play with other kids. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, if you do that, if you go play for 10 minutes, you get a green check mark. You get three green check marks, you get tablet time. So mm-hmm. a lot of it's um, positive reinforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know also with a lot of people who deal with kids on the spectrum, they don't always like the ABA um, part of that. But I have to say it has to work for your kid. I right. love it. Grayson needs structure. He's had a couple of therapists who were way too nice, and he just walked all over them. Mm-hmm. Like, he he had his kindergarten teacher this year. She was, like, a sergeant, and that's what he needs. Yeah, she yeah. was a lovely sergeant. Right, she right. was great for him. Gentle, but, like... <laughs> yeah, she was, like, a... She would say a witch in the fall and a, and a, and a princess in the summer or in the spring, the springtime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what he needed. Mm-hmm. So, for people listening, can you share kind of some of the more common symptoms of signs that children may show with autism because I know it's one's very different from boys and girls yeah yeah yeah. so um I again my daughter's not on the autism spectrum Mm -hmm. even though I'm she'll (laughs) she'll get mad sometimes when my son uses headphones and I'll talk about the symptoms in a minute or gets a squishy toy I remember one time she said I wish I was autistic (laughs) (laughs) because that's just what she knows I thought it was so cute Mm -hmm. um and sweet and, um, but the signs, um, some of the main signs, again, it's a spectrum. So, mm-hmm. um, there's, there's this term like, you know, high functioning, low functioning. Right. I don't, I don't know if I really like that term. I say high functioning for him, but if he's low functioning, I don't think I'd be comfortable saying that. Right. And a lot of times people ask me when I say he's autistic, they go, oh, is he verbal? I guess, because it's a spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, so Grayson is very verbal. He talks a lot. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we can't get him to stop talking. <laughs> and that could be another thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but one thing that we really noticed with him at young age was the eye contact. So when he talks to you, he doesn't always look you in the eye. He'll always go over here or look up or maybe like just, you know, go this way. Like he right. doesn't talk, like to hold eye contact that long. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the ABA goals for a while was making eye contact. And we said, no, like, we're not going to force him to do that. Yeah. Just to face towards them. And sometimes I'll ask him to hold my hand or just squeeze just so I know he's hearing me. Right. Because for him, that's just uncomfortable. I'm not Mm going to make him uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There's other ways to make sure he's paying attention to me rather than just with eye contact. Right. Um, Staring off was one of the – I was thinking about the things, too, as far as autism. um, Things to look for. Some of the things I've seen on those sheets that we've uh, Mm – all the – assessments that he's failed or passed uh, throughout the years but yeah staring off um being obsessive over toys so if you're like lining things up in a row and kind of just playing like a little irregular um sometimes is as kind of a a um, indication I think also that transition not being able to transition Mm -hmm. if they're older like four or five and they're still having massive meltdowns that can be one Mm -hmm. um delayed speech regression um, but those are all things that I don't think people should be afraid of. Mm-hmm. And even if your child's not speaking now, that doesn't mean they're not going to be verbal later on. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of great tools and resources available. So one thing I would say to parents is like, be aware, um, or even, you know, parents, caregivers, a well-meaning friend. If you're seeing something that's a little not typical, let the parent know mm-hmm. and let them know it's okay. I think that's one thing I've talked to, um, especially a lot of dads. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's nothing wrong with my kid. 
there's nothing wrong with my kid. Right. No, there's nothing wrong with my kid either. He's just a different way of being human, and I want to give him all the tools and resources to be successful. So one thing I always say, too, is when we're in these IEP meetings and everything and other kind of meetings with school district, I'm like, I don't want him to be good for a kid on the spectrum. I want him to be the best he can be. Mm-hmm. So him being on the spectrum isn't going to hold him back. Right. You know, it's just, it's just who he is. And I don't, I don't want him to be cured of autism Mm -hmm. because if he was, I don't think I would know everything about animals through him. (laughs) I don't think he would have written in his kindergarten homework about the, the moles of the subnivian zone. Right. Which still no teacher knows about. (laughs) (laughs) And these are things that he's able to pick up because his mind works differently. Mm -hmm. So instead of think, instead of doing things that a quote normal kid would be thinking about, he he's thinking about things that are so ahead of his age and time. Mm-hmm. But not all kids on the spectrum are like that. And not all kids on the spectrum have superpowers or, or something that people think about. It is a spectrum. And I think you just have to love them and give them the support that they need, just like you would any other kid. Right. And not be afraid of it. Because mm-hmm. there's so much support out there. So have you noticed from other parents where maybe their child is not verbal or they're having a harder time socializing or cues if there's kind of not resentment, but kind of jealousy or envy or maybe they have some type of Mm. hard feelings with their situation? No, I have never seen that towards us. Mm -hmm. Um, no, when we're going to the clinic, I think we're all having a hard time getting them all in on time right. and getting them out. But it is it is interesting seeing um, the other kids with, like, their um, speaking tools, which is basically, like, a tablet, and they can point, and they can say things for them. And then, like, kids um speech and physical therapy. There's other kids that have way more severe disabilities who mm-hmm. are walking, who are may- very cognitively de- um, developed and other neurological issues. And I was going, like, oh, man. You know, mm-hmm. and I think, oh, wow, this is like, you know, this is even if we're having a really hard day with with autism, if we're having a hard day because he is one transition or he's still having a meltdown. I'm like, oh, well, at least it's I, you know, it could be worse. But then I look at them and they're still loving their kids mm-hmm. and they're still happy with them. So I've learned not to pity people like that. Right, right. Like we have these children that we've been given and we just have to love them. And, you know, they're still going to do amazing things in their own ways and they're going to. They're going to bring, like, love and, and goodness in this world in any way they can. Because mm-hmm. they're kids. And that's right. what kids do. Yeah, I was just curious about the mental health aspect as a parent. Because, you know, having, you know, kind of like before when you said when you were pregnant, like, oh, I hope, you know, mm-hmm. having that those thoughts and then yeah. you know, having to go through yeah. the learning curve. Yeah, I think there's there's one thing I really don't like when you do these autism assessments especially if you're the mother of the child and you had a normal pregnancy, they ask you all the questions about your pregnancy. And it's mm-hmm. almost like I really wish they – and I understand why because they're trying to figure out why this happens. Mm-hmm. Um, but I hate that because mm-hmm. it's like – it's almost like you're putting an onus on me. And I'm like, well, why don't you ask questions about what my husband was eating before? <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, they're his, his, his family mental health. And so I really I don't like that. But the, the mental health aspect of it is real. Um, there are days where I've said out loud, like, I hate autism. Mm-hmm. I hate it. It's hard. Mm-hmm. And I don't hate my child. I hate that, you know, sometimes that it's he won't get his shoes on because he's thinking about something else. But... And it can, it can make our life a little harder. He's having a hard day because he can't regulate himself. But we've learned to give him the tools to do so. Mm-hmm. So if he's having a hard day, it's not because of him. And it's not because of autism. It's because he doesn't have what he needs to regulate. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have that time to, to relax and be able to give, you know, some kind of sensory needs to not feel overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, when we first got the diagnosis, my husband, I think, had it really hard, too. We were constantly thinking, like, oh, you know, did I, did I, was I too rough with him that one time? You know, did I throw him up in the air when he was a baby? Or he hit his head that one time and tripped over a toy. And I don't, I think you can go crazy mm-hmm. um, thinking, like, whoa, me, why me? Right. Um, or you can just, and I feel like those feelings are very valid, too. I think there's also um, a little bit of, oh, my son will never be able to do that. And I think that's with anybody with any kind of special needs or, or medical illness or chronic diseases. Oh, he might never be able to play baseball like mm-hmm. you would with, you know, a, a neurotypical kid. He'll never be able to, you know, he might not go on dates normally. He might not be able to do things. But I've seen my son do things that we never thought would he would any kid would ever do. 
You know, like one time we were listening to the radio and they were talking about volcano that, you know, they erupted. And he said, oh, mom, can you, can we um, contact that volcanologist that just spoke? I was like, the what? I wasn't really listening. He was five. And I was like, what's a volcanologist? He's like, no, mom, remember you told me ologist means study of. So it's somebody who studies volcanoes. And I almost slammed the brakes. I'm like, what? And we became pen pals with volcanologists. I was like, how many five-year-old little boys... I was like, yeah, so we don't need to throw any baseballs around because it's like these are the cool things that we get to learn from him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That, so what are some other things right now that Grayson's really into or really loving to learn right now? It's animals. Animals. He's he's all about animals. Well, before I came over here, uh, we had some monarch butterflies in our front yard. We just planted mm-hmm. a bunch of um, butterfly-friendly and uh, bee-friendly plants. Because of Grayson and then my daughter Reese mm-hmm. will do anything Big Brother does because he wants to attract butterflies and he wants to attract bees because mm-hmm. he's heard that they're both on decline. So he wants to make sure that there's plenty of them in the world. Right. And uh, so he was asking me to show me how to grab a monarch butterfly so we could tag it like the scientists do oh, okay. to track it. Uh-huh. And I was like, I don't even know if you can grab a butterfly. He's like, yes, I can. And he like, went and showed me a video. And I was like, how do you know these things? <laughs> And those moments make the, make it really easy to be a parent of mm-hmm. a kid with autism. And kind of going back to your question on mental health, there there are days where it does it's harder. Mm-hmm. There's days when you might see, you know, other kids playing and they're having a good time together. Even my daughter, my daughter knows every kid in her class his name. She's a Miss Popular, and uh, Grayson's always going to be like that. He doesn't remember anyone's name except for a couple of kids. Yeah. When he's at a party um, with other kids, he doesn't want to play with them. He wants to kind of be left alone. Mm-hmm. So those days are kind of hard when you realize, like, oh, my kid is different. But then he's telling me how to tag a monarch butterfly. And I'm like, okay, everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. You just have those moments. Right. I kind of want to go into now you sharing the story about Grayson's class classmates and everything because when you first told me that man I was getting teary when I get teary (laughs) yeah it's such an amazing story because I want to touch on it because I I from first grade through eighth grade we had someone in my grade that was autistic and I can visually remember being younger and not knowing Mm -hmm. he was autistic and you don't know Mm -hmm. how to treat that and I remember you know kids would do certain things to kind of make it worse yeah and you don't yeah so I, those memories are still mm. they're still very close yeah and um so I when I heard your story with Grace it just was amazing so I would just love for you to share it because it's so sweet yeah um so I think about that too with the kids you didn't know who are who are autistic mm-hmm. um but yeah but but then I love the story too so like I said we're fierce advocates for our son and so um, ever since he got his diagnosis, we've been very clear with him what he has and what and why he has it, and how it makes him different. So he's a very he's a very good um, self advocate for himself, which is great. So we have this book for him called um, All My Stripes. It's about a little zebra who has an autism stripe, mm-hmm. and he kind of talks about his school day, and then um, at the end of the book is like why he loves his autism stripe. So we've had that book for him ever since he got diagnosed. So um, his teacher is amazing this year. The one who's kind of like a sergeant, who's mm-hmm. great, Miss Wentworth. I love her. <laughs> and um, so it was um, April's Autism Awareness Month, and we'd become really close to teacher and I because um, Grayson had kind of a rough first patch of the year. Um, he, we've decided through her um, notes, and and she took a um, assessment for him too, and we got him on some ADHD medication because that's. He also has ADHD too. Mm-hmm. And there was a time with the craziness of the world and there was a shortage. So he got on the, we finally got him the right dosage, the right type. And then it was got, it was out of stock for like three and a half weeks, almost mm-hmm. a month. So we had made all this headway with him in school and then he went back. Mm-hmm. And so her and I and him, we had been working really hard together. So um, I felt very comfortable with her. And I said, hey, so we're th- April is Autism Awareness Month. Can we do some kind of little lesson plan? for about kids with autism and she's like yes let me check with my principal and they say yes and I was like okay I have this book you can bring it in she was like great so I sent Grayson a book with the school and his little autism rocks t-shirt and um, they had a little like special ability sign outside of the school that week Mm -hmm. with like puzzle pieces and all kinds of things so she read this book about what it's like to be on the autism spectrum for a class full of 
mostly neurotypical kids. And um, they all loved it. Mm-hmm. And Grayson kind of got up and started talking about what it's like to be autistic <laughs> on his own. Yeah. And started talking about why he wears headphones and things like that. So that was on a Monday. Then that Friday, I go into um, his school because it was his birthday that weekend. Mm-hmm. And so I brought cupcakes. And um, I was putting the cupcakes outside for the kids. And one of the little girls comes out and goes, oh, Mrs. Hendrick, I have Grayson's headphones in case it gets too loud. I was like, oh, thank you, sweetheart. Um, and I was like, oh, wow. She goes, I know kids on the autism spectrum. They can't take loud noises. And I was like, wow. Like, that's amazing. You're five. This is great. And then all these kids come out and they sit down and they quietly sing happy birthday to my son. And then I noticed something. And they all have these plastic little um, bracelets, kind of like the little strong bracelets. But it says autism awareness. And this teacher bought all the kids autism awareness bracelets And so all these kids afterwards from this little boy that we thought was going to have a hard time making friends, they're going up giving him hugs, Mm -hmm. telling them why they love Grayson, how special he is. And then his teacher got our family these little special autism bracelets. And so they all sing him happy birthday and they're all telling me why they love Grayson. And I was thinking about it. I was like, these group of 25 year olds, because his teacher listened to us, loved Grayson, loves him, and understood that he has the special needs, but he can use it in a way where he's going to thrive in the classroom. And he was included. And I thought that this was such a great story about being inclusive because I think about those 20 kindergartners. Mm -hmm. So next year when they go to three different first grade classes and they see a kid that's spinning or flapping or acting weird, they're not going to make fun of them. Mm -hmm. They're not going to say, oh, you're being weird or... You know, you're you're acting abnormal. It's like, oh, he might be like my friend Grayson. Mm-hmm. So when they're in high school and when they're when they're when they're in college and when they go to work, and I'm like, gosh, could you imagine what we could do if every kindergarten classroom learned about this? And so now his teacher bought that book, and this is part right. I get kind of teary eyed. Um, in the the front of the book, she has a picture of Grayson, mm-hmm. and she wrote why who Grayson is. And I just thought, like, here's this little boy that we we were afraid he was going to be able to go in a regular classroom because of his diagnosis. We were afraid that he might not be able to make friends. And he's, like, changing the world just by being who he is. And that's the, the best gift a mom can have. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying right now not to, like... <laughs> I, I get emotional because I think about my former classmate and the way the kids were mean to him mm-hmm. and you know i have to admit as well me not knowing yeah you don't know yeah you can you, t- you join in that so it's i'm so happy for grayson that he had experience and it's so awesome that on his own he was like hey i have autism and this is me and this is wh- what like oh yeah he'll when we're playing loud music he'll come down and be like don't you remember i have autism <laughs> like a crazy little man um but i i i love that fierceness about him because i i think if you have anything that makes you different you should celebrate it mm-hmm. and even as adults and the things that we're, we're dealing with and you know having anxiety and depression and it's i have to be give it kudos to the younger generation because i love being able to talk about these things i love having it more out, out in the open because none of us are perfect, mm-hmm. and we all have things, and I I think that that's just that's such beauty, and I, I love learning from my kids, and um, the other thing, too, I think about going back to being a parent of a kid on the spectrum and having a child who's not on the spectrum, too, mm-hmm. is making sure that we give them equal time, right, right. and so when we're giving my son all this extra time and energy, make sure we're giving my daughter that, too, as well, mm-hmm. um, and so I think that can be really hard sometimes, but that's why... Um, one of us will take Grace into a, a therapy and the other one will stay back with, with our daughter, Reese. Mm-hmm. So that's really important, too. Yeah, I've heard from some of my peers where if they had a sibling that had some type of disability or mm-hmm. had a harder time, for them, they felt neglected yeah. and all that. So it's it's great that you bring that up, too, to just share because it – for the other child, yeah, it, it can be hard to understand. Yeah, and I don't want my kids to feel that way. As a millennial parent, I, I can remember, you know, not really my family, but just, you know, if a kid was messing up or a kid needed extra attention, the kid who was doing, who's a, a 
you know, fine, didn't need as much attention, Mm -hmm. which everyone needs attention. That's Mm -hmm. what parents are are for. Right. And so, yeah, I'm, and I have um, some friends now who have heard that kids are older on on the spectrum who never got a diagnosis or they got a diagnosis later. And um, even some younger adults or middle-aged adults who never got interventions and they will be reliant on another human being for the rest of their life because they didn't get that intervention. So if you see signs, if you're, if you are, you think there might be something wrong, get, get the help. Mm -hmm. And also something I learned about through my work is that kids who exhibit behaviors on the spectrum might not even have autism. They might have post-traumatic stress. Mm. They might have another mental health um, need, but you can still get those services for them, especially if you're a Medi-Cal. Right. You don't have to have a diagnosis, a diagnosis to get speech, to get ABA. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think you want your kids to thrive and you do anything for them. So through all the services you can. Um, but one thing we've also realized is that the therapies were a little too intense. He was having speech, OT, which is occupational therapy, PT. Um, those are one day a week. So three different therapies one day a week, and they're all on Thursdays for him. Mm-hmm. And then he had ABA therapy four days a week, which was a lot. Yeah. So we've decreased that now as he's getting older. We're doing ABA twice a week. So he can join, like, a baseball team or do a STEM camp or right. robotics so we can give him a little bit normal life because mm-hmm. we don't want everything he does just to be therapy right. either. Yeah. But we, we worked with his doctors, and we understand, like, what his needs are and what we can push back and – if he's not going to do PT as much, okay, let's get him in a soccer team or some other sport too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you just have to work with your doctors mm-hmm. like you would for anything. Right. Yeah. It's it's great to hear too that, you know, there are resources out there and it's accessible. A and that there's a lot. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. Regional centers, which I thought you had to be at a certain, um, like, income requirement. Nope. If your kid has any kind of therapy, special needs, go to your go to your resource uh, your re- in the regional center. Um, if you have a kid who's not school age, call a preschool. Or, I mean, so call the school district. See if they have a preschool to see what kind of interventions they might have. Summer camps. Um, there's like cities now are offering inclusive sports programs, which is oh, really awesome. Very cool. And I think it's great. Mm-hmm. And I just I. I wish we could have a little bit more, like, intersection with kids on the spectrum and kids not. Um, and I think that's great. So, yeah, there's a ton of resources. And there's just every, a lot of people are dealing with it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of support groups. Um, I love the Inland Empire Autism Society. They I, they have these um, on social media. They have, like, a Monday milestones. And they have parents shared, like, the milestones their kids have overcome. That's Amazing. Awesome. And That's it gives awesome. you so – yeah, it gives you so much hope. And um, they have different, like, networking groups and things like that. So there's a lot. So if you're a parent or even maybe someone who's an adult who might be thinking they're on the autism spectrum, but you're not alone. Like I said, it's it's about one in eight now. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of us dealing with it. So yeah. don't be afraid of it. Because they're going to thrive and the kids are going to love them. Mm -hmm. They're going to, because if you're just your authentic self, Mm -hmm. people will love you. Yeah. When they know you can't hate someone you love. Right. And you can't be mean to someone that you love. So if kids are bullying someone because they're doing something weird, what they think is weird, like flapping their arms, spinning around in a circle, it's just they don't know. Mm -hmm. But now they know. Yeah. I think it's just so amazing that, that they had that class that um Grayson's teacher was able to sit down with everybody and read it and now they know and like you said earlier where when they go to the next grade they're gonna be able to know I think that's so amazing and are is there ways where you think we could start implementing that throughout all school districts yeah Yeah. and the the reason why I got the idea for that is I have to say it's a shout out to the Inland Empire Autism Society because their, um, their newsletter that I get every month, they had ideas on how to implement, like, a lesson plan. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I heard from my son's teacher, she's like, don't wait till April. She's like, ask his teacher to read that book first week of school next year. Mm-hmm. And then she was thinking, like, oh, maybe I should get a book about a kid who, um, you know, for other disabilities. Like, maybe for kids what in a, a wheelchair or people, kids who yeah. might have hearing and vision impairments. So it's, like, just that inclusive um, inclusivity, not just for kids who might have those special needs, but for the other kids, not to be afraid of it. Mm-hmm. I think that's something we're kind of scarily getting into in this day and age. It's like, 
we are othering people who are different Mm -hmm. and we're not necessarily being inclusive just for them, but to let everyone else know, like, it's okay to be different. Yeah. And you're going to have friends who are different. You're going to still love them Mm -hmm. and accept them and you don't have to do everything for them either. So yeah, I'm hoping to do that more every year for his school. And then I'm hoping to work hopefully with the um, principal so we can Mm -hmm. get that in his school. Yeah. And then, um, but the one thing that I would love to see more is I recognize that I go, my son goes to a very privileged school district. We live in a nice area and, you know, middle income and above. And I recognize that we are very privileged because of just our, our stature, our socioeconomic background, healthcare industry knowledge. My husband's an educator. So I would love to see more parents be able to feel supported no matter where they are, get more of the education. I know there's a couple of great nonprofits in the Coachella Valley area that are working specifically with immigrant families and Spanish-speaking populations to provide support not just to the kids who have special needs, but the entire family, mm. including doing a summer camp for siblings with kids, with uh, um, siblings who have special needs. I love that. Yeah. So because if you, you know, I just, we're lucky. And we're, we're just lucky. We we have everything we have for him because we're, we're lucky. Mm-hmm. And I know that not everyone has that. So whatever we can do as a society to move mountains so every kid who's on the spectrum like Grayson can have what he has. Mm-hmm. So I like I told you before, but I have another guest coming on eventually. And she's around my age, but she just recently discovered that she's on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. And so she's actually also... Um, like a speech coach therapist for with children on the spectrum. So it's I'm excited for her to come on to share her experience yeah. with it as an adult and all that. But I think I'm I'm really appreciative that you wanted to share about that cuz it's if I think if people aren't directly related to somebody or no they they there's so much information that yeah. you don't even know what yeah. what the spectrum means or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. We've, we, you know, if you look at some of the media out there, I think a lot of people found about um, the autism spectrum with that movie about Temple Grandin, mm-hmm. who didn't want to be held to, and yeah, that's a spectrum of it. Um, but, you know, and not everyone who has autism is not the rain man either. You know, right, right. It, it is a spectrum. So I think, yeah, just being inclusive and, and again, not being afraid of it. And um, yeah, there are some days where it's really hard. But as a parent and as a human being, there's going to be always hard days. Mm-hmm. So I just hope that anybody, um, I've had a couple of friends, it's like, oh, I don't know if we should. I'm like, yes, just do it. Because the worst thing is, no, they 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 don't have it. Or yeah. it's like, you know what? They do maybe have some behavioral issues. Um, the whole entire world's gone crazy the last couple of years. Yes. And we didn't have normal childhoods. Mm-hmm. And these kids didn't have a lot of social emotional learning and being be around other kids. And there, there is a higher group of children now in speech therapy because they weren't talking with other people for so long mm-hmm. and weren't going to preschool. So I would say not be afraid of it. And, you know, and if you if you see a kid in your life who might be flapping or spinning circles or there might be something, I, I would, I would, in a very gentle way, just talk to the parent. Like, mm-hmm. hey, I've noticed these things. Have you talked to their doctor? Because a lot of times when they're younger, you can just bring bring those up. And don't be afraid to bring them up with your doctor. And there's nothing wrong with your kid if they're flapping. There's nothing wrong with them if they're not making eye contact. They're just going to need support interventions. And they're going to need those teachers to, you know, be supportive for them. And I think if you support that teacher and you give them the tools and resources, they're going to do it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I just wanted to like briefly and like touch on the show Love on the Spectrum. Like, yes. God, it's such an amazing show. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's funny too. Yeah. And uh, that's a great show. And we've, um, my husband and I have gone back and watched um, Community. Mm-hmm. I remember that show. And there's there's a character on there. The actor's not autistic, but you know, it was back when people would say Asperger's and autism. And there's a couple times on that show where the that character Ovid's done something and, like, our son's done it. Mm. And it's so funny. Same thing with Love on the Spectrum. Or there was another show on Netflix that was about a kid who was on the autism spectrum. And that one made me laugh because he was obsessed about penguins. <laughs> and his it was about a kid who was in high school on the spectrum. And his girlfriend let him only talk about penguins three times a day. 
<laughs> which reminds me of so many things my son will talk about. Right. So um, it's nice to see um, people on the spectrum represented in film and TV. And I know mm-hmm. there's a bunch of other shows on it. We were a little nervous at first to watch Love on the Spectrum because we're like, oh, I don't know if that's too close to home. We're like, oh, my gosh. They're, it's so funny. It's so sweet. Yeah. I, I think they did a really good job of genuinely showing mm-hmm. each person their yes. experience yes. and then also the variety. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I loved it. And I loved that first season of Young Man who was like very obsessive about getting a wife, which yes. I thought was a great way to be obsessive about. <laughs> I, I cannot, I'm not ready for Grayson um, with that. But also one thing I've been sharing with a lot of family members too is people on the spectrum also tend, they have a higher, this autism community also has a, is also a very um, diverse community as far as part of, being part of the LGBTQ plus community. Mm-hmm. So a lot of them might not identify as a gender. They might not really you know, um, stick to a specific type of, um, wine, you know, yeah. they might not, you know, feel like they are attracted to men or women or both. Or so I, that's my, I, I tell people all the time. Cause I'm like, mm-hmm. I, we don't know. I don't know what Grayson's going to be into, or if he's even going to be into anybody. Sometimes they're just not interested in, in romance and that's fine too. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure he's going to keep us on our toes like he usually does. Yeah. But just be mindful of that because I don't want that to be another hurdle too. Right, right. It's like it is these – they're, you know, they're on the spectrum yeah. in all ways. It's, it's good to have that reminder of, you know, the things that you expect your children to – like the milestones that, mm-hmm. you know, just society has. Put yes. To remember that you – not even if the child is not on the spectrum, like those things aren't like the necessity milestones. Yeah, and there's there's specific milestones you want to look at to make sure they're developing, mm-hmm. and there's things you might want to bring back to your doctor, and that's why they're there. They're mm-hmm. there to like, okay, let's look and you see what other things I might need help with. But yeah, I think for us too is like not to get, you know, oh, he, I look at the kid in his class. He's writing full sentences. He's doing this. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, at any age, like, you know, not to, not to compete and, you know, right. I, I still do it. I'm like, oh, I wish I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. It's mm-hmm. fine. Like, you know, um, Michelle Obama's mom once said, don't parent the kid you want to have parent the kid you have. I really love that. Yes. Yeah. Michelle Obama's mom was very smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very smart. Yeah. She did a great job of raising that, <laughs> raising her. Do you think it's good to remind people as well that if maybe they have those thoughts to give themselves grace? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, that's the one thing with being a parent is it's hard. Um, and you're always going to have ex- – you have always expectations for yourself. So mm-hmm. when you don't meet them yourself, mm-hmm. it's hard. And so when you have your kids and you think – and now I look at my kids now and I try to be mindful. I'm like, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know if they're going to want to have kids. I don't know who they're going to want to marry. I just, I tell them all the time, I just want you to grow to be happy, empathetic, kind adults. Mm -hmm. That's all I want. Whatever they choose to do with their lives, that's with them. But as long as they have happiness inside their heart, they're kind and empathetic towards other people. Because I feel like there's things going on in our world because we have lost that lack of empathy. And going back to my son's class, like that little lesson that took probably 10 minutes out of a whole week is going to be an, a long-lasting lesson of empathy. Like, just imagine if we did that every day. Mm-hmm. Like, how much different this world would look. Right. So, yeah. That's what I want. That's what I want for them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Cheers. Thank you for having me. No, yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I'm really thankful and appreciative that you're wanting to open up and share your experience and oh, Grace's yeah. experience because I think it's very important for people to hear. Yes. So. And then, like, 20 years from now when he's a famous volcanologist or – you know, cured climate change. Or he <laughs> saved the butterflies and the bees. Yes, yeah. he saved all the butterflies and bees. <laughs> He's found a new species of them. Yeah. Yeah. No, again, thank you so much. Yeah, this was a really good episode. Yes, thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. Well, guys, I'm going to wrap it up here, but I hoped you really enjoyed this episode. And I, I'm i expecting that most of you got really emotional with that story because <laughs> I, the, me sitting here, I was just like, okay. I heard it twice, but even still, (laughs) (laughs) it's really good. But yeah, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you on the next one. If you haven't already, you can rate it on Apple and Spotify and share with friends and have a good rest of your day. Bye.